Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. For today's discussion, we'll be talking about exercise 47 or the urinary system. This will be part of your finals and we decided to do this asynchronously so that everybody will be on the same page and more importantly, you can study this topic ahead of time and not wait for our meeting before getting familiar with the terms and even the entire discussion. If you're ready, then let's start. The urinary system is actually composed of a series of tubes and pipings. And the main goal of these tubes and pipes is to create urine so that waste and toxic materials can be excreted from the body. The organs involved in the formation of urine and in the transport of urine from the source to the external part of the body includes the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra. We'll be discussing each and every individual organ, but we'll be focusing mainly on the kidneys. The kidneys are actually bean-shaped organs that lie on the posterior abdominal wall. So they are located behind the abdomen specifically behind the peritoneum, with one kidney on each side of the vertebral column, which means that we do have a kidney on the left and also a kidney on the right. Remember that the peritoneum is a serous membrane which lines or protects or covers the internal wall of the abdomen and all other abdominal organs, specifically of the digestive system. Since the kidneys are located behind the peritoneum, they are also described to be retroperitoneal organs. Retro meaning behind and peritoneal as a description of their location. So, the main function of the kidneys is to eliminate waste products by producing urine and by excreting urine through a process called urination. So that's the entire function of the kidneys. Talking about the surface anatomy of the kidneys, we will first observe the hilum. The hilum is this indented part in the medial side of the kidney. So if this is medial, then we can say that this is the right kidney, right? So it's an indentation in the medial side of the kidney where the blood vessels like the renal artery, the renal vein, even the nerves and the ureter exit. The kidneys are also protected by a layer of adipose tissue that surrounds the entire organ. And this is this yellow structure that you see surrounding the kidney. And we call that the renal fat pad. Deep inside the renal fat pad and lying closely to the kidneys is a fibrous outer wall of connective tissue called renal capsule that is represented by this red line that you see surrounding the kidney. Going more internally, after the renal capsule, you will uh, appreciate the cortex. This is the cortex right here. It is the outer region of the kidney. We'll be working our way from out to inside. Okay? So the outer region is called cortex. The inner region, which is majority of the kidney, is called medulla. Cortex and medulla are not new terms since they are also terms that we use for the adrenal glands. And where are the adrenals located? On top of the kidney. So somehow, they have a similar configuration, right? Deep inside the medulla are cone-shaped or triangular-shaped sections called renal pyramids. And these are the ones being pointed out to at the moment. So they appear triangular or as some would say, cone-shaped, and they are the occupy majority of the medulla. The tips of the renal pyramid, this pointed tip at the middle, that uh, mount of those 
triangular or pyramidal shapes are what we call renal papilla. And the function of the renal papilla is actually to collect urine. So you are right. Urine is being formed from the cortex to the medulla to the renal pyramids. And the urine formed in those areas will be collected by the renal papilla before it is brought to the renal calyx. The renal calyx are these yellowish tubes that you see here connected to those pointed tips of the renal papilla. Specifically, there is a major calyx, which is the bigger portion, and a minor calyx, which is attached to each individual renal papilla. But for our discussion purposes, we'll just refer to them um, as a group and we'll call them the renal calyx. After the renal calyx, you will observe the renal pelvis. That is the bigger tube formed by the union of the different major calyces. So the renal pelvis is a union of the different renal calyces. And eventually, it will become the ureter, as you can see in this image. From the renal pelvis, once it exits the hilum, it will become the ureter. Okay? Afterwards, there are spaces in between. The, the spaces are located in between the calyces. Um, it in, it's in between the renal pyramids and papilla. And that's what you call renal sinus. It's a fat-filled cavity containing many blood vessels, as you can see here in this image. They also contain adipose tissue and the collecting tubes, um, specifically the calyces, right? Next is uh, we want to discuss the blood flow through the urine. So the blood supply of the, the urine mainly comes from the renal artery. The renal artery is from the abdominal aorta and it enters the hilum and then extends itself to the renal sinuses or those fat-filled cavity as previously mentioned. Once it enters the renal sinuses, it will have to divide itself in order to provide blood to the different areas of the kidneys. So from a renal artery, it will then become the segmental artery. It will be called the segmental artery. Once those segmental arteries reach the renal pyramids, then we will call them interlobar artery. I'm sorry. Interlobar artery. It will then extend further to the outer part of the kidney until it reaches the space in between the cortex and the medulla and it will be called the arcuate arteries. So arcuate arteries, these are the small parts here, the small vessels here. These are the ones located in between the cortex and the medulla. Once it goes further, into the cortex, they will then be called interlobular. So interlobar is for the renal pyramids, but for the cortex, it's interlobular right here. It will then become or form the afferent arterioles, which is part or will become part of the glomerulus. Let's focus our attention to this image on the right. So you have your interlobular lobular artery, which supplies the cortex, and then it will give off the afferent interior arteriole, which will become a part of your glomerulus. The glomerulus is actually a microscopic unit and is formed by capillaries, after which it will exit as the efferent arteriole, which is an extension of the glomerulus, and then will form this network called peritubular capillaries. So this entire structure, this entire network of blood vessels here is called peritubular capillaries, which supplies blood to the nephron. 
Later, we'll go to what the nephron is. And then eventually, the blood vessels will exit as venules, the interlobular vein, the arcuate vein, the interlobar vein, segmental vein, and then the renal vein. And then it will exit the hilum and it will drain the oxygenated blood to the inferior vena cava. If you did not understand that, I would suggest that you try to replay what I just previously mentioned. Now let's go to nephron anatomy. So the nephrons are actually the functional unit of the kidney. So that image that you just previously saw is actually the entire nephron. No? It is composed of a renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is actually the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So that renal corpuscle is that spherical structure that you see here at the beginning of the nephron. And the renal tubule, which is the second part of the nephron, is this convoluted tubes that you see here on the right part. Let's talk about the renal corpuscle first. The renal corpuscle is again composed of the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So the glomerulus is a ball of glomerular carpary, car capillaries from the afferent arteriole given off by the interlobular artery. So that series of capillaries together with a double-walled capsule surrounding the glomerulus will form a filtrate or a filtration barrier, okay? So that filtration barrier will be in charge of filtering the blood in order to produce urine. And the Bowman's capsule is able to perform that filtration ability due to the specialized cells called podocytes. Again, podocytes are specialized cells which gives the Bowman's capsule the ability to act as a filter. Okay? So, both that series of capillaries plus the double-walled membrane of the Bowman's capsule forms the renal corpuscle. The proximal convoluted tubule, on the other hand, is part of that renal tubule network being mentioned here. So from, um, from after the renal corpuscle until it goes to the collecting tubule, that's the entire renal tubule that is being mentioned. The first part is the proximal convoluted tubule, proximal to the renal corpuscle or proximal to the glomerulus, okay? This is this area here. The proximal convoluted tubule is a narrow coil, coil channel from the Bowman's capsule. Further down, we will see this loop which goes down and then goes back up and that is the loop of Henle. Those two parts are the descending loop and since it is descending, from the cortex, it will enter the medulla. Because this entire upper part is found in the cortex. And then as the descending loop goes down, it will traverse the medulla. And then it will go back up as the ascending loop and then go back to the cortex. I hope that's clear. Afterwards, we have the distal convoluted tubule. This is this part right here at the top, the distal convoluted tubule. It's parallel to the proximal convoluted tubule, but it's farther from the glomerulus. That's why it's called distal. And the job of the DCT or distal convoluted tubule is to receive filtrates from the loop. So all the urine or all the filtrates coming from the loop of Henle will be gathered by the distal convoluted tubule. Lastly, we have this large tube right here, which is our collecting tubule. Obviously, from the name itself, it's a tube that collects urine from the many 
distal convoluted tubules of the different many nephrons in the body and it brings the urine to the renal pyramid if you still remember from the renal pyramid it will go to the renal papilla it will go to the renal calyx it will then go to the renal pelvis and then down to the ureter so that's the flow of your urine okay so basically urine is formed in the kidneys by a series of steps um, and those steps specifically include glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion. And this process of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion is performed on blood. So urine is formed from our blood and not from the water that we drink. Okay, so the total renal blood flow reaches an approximate of 1,200 to 1,500 ml per minute, meaning more than 1.2 to 1.5 liters of blood goes to the kidneys every minute. And every minute, urine is being formed. Because blood is continually filtered, reabsorbed, and secreted. So we'll be talking about those steps individually. First, we have the glomerular filtration. So being by the name itself, you would know that the focus of glomerular filtration will be on the glomerulus or the renal corpuscle. What are the two parts of the renal corpuscle again? We have the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So the glomerulus is a series of blood vessels which forms a capillary network and that capillary network is called the glomerular, glomerular filtration barrier. So this is the one that you see in this image here, no? the glomerular filtration barrier. On top of that, the Bowman's capsule, that double-layered membrane, filled with specialized cells called podocytes contributes to that filtration barrier. So both the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule forms a non-selective filtration of plasma whereby the basis of filtration is size and charge. Okay? So... This means that the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule does not choose what substance to allow based on charge and size. They do not select. That's why they are called non-selective, right? They do not select what goes through or what passes through. As long as they are small enough to pass and as long as they are positively charged, they will be filtrated into the urine. Okay? Let me say that again. The glomerular filtration barrier formed by the capillary network of the glomerulus plus the double-layered membrane of the Bowman's capsule lined by the specialized cells of podocytes forms a non-selective filtration barrier. They do not select what goes through as long as it is positively charged and they are small enough, they are able to pass through. So why is the positive charge important? Because the glomerular filtration barrier formed by the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule forms a shield of negativity, meaning they do not allow negatively charged particles to be filtrated or to enter even if they are small enough to pass. So no matter how small the substance is, if they are negatively charged, they are repelled or they are not allowed to pass through that barrier as you can see in the GIF below. No? Of the 180 liters of blood being filtered per day, only 1% become urine. Okay, 
So that's your glomerular filtration. Next, we have the tubular reabsorption. So what tubes are again found in the nephron? We have the proximal convoluted tubule. We have the loop of Henle. We have the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. So in the tubular reabsorption process, substances in the blood filtrate or in the urine will be reabsorbed into the blood. Okay? So let's say because the, the barrier formed by the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule is non-selective. So sometimes important substances will be flown into the urine. And since the body needs those substances, reabsorption is important. No? Mainly, that substance which is highly reabsorbed is water. Okay? Water and salt or sodium chloride. So the proximal convoluted tubule, this area here, is the primary site for the reabsorption of solutes such as sodium chloride and most importantly of water. In fact, it is able to reabsorb 65% of water. Imagine, 65% of water is reabsorbed by the body in the proximal convoluted tubule. Remember that. We might ask that. Further down, we have the loop of Henle. Again, the descending loop found in the medulla. That's why there is a color change here from a lighter cream color to a yellowish color because this bottom part is already at the medulla. No? This descending loop and we have the ascending loop. So the loop of Henle continues to reabsorb water and sodium chloride, but it is of a lesser extent. Specifically, the descending loop. It is critical for the reabsorption of water, but it's only able to absorb 15% of water. And, uh, but there is a low permeability to ions. Okay? In the ascending loop, Here's the difference. They, it cannot reabsorb water, but it can reabsorb a lot of solutes. So they are quite opposite, the descending and the ascending loop. No, The descending loop is able to absorb water, but it cannot reabsorb solutes or ions. So water, water lang inaabsorb niya. Salt, it cannot absorb too much. No, Pero for the ascending loop, it it does not reabsorb water, but it reabsorbs a lot of solutes and ions such as your sodium chloride. So that's your tubular reabsorption. Also part of the tubular reabsorption is the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. And again, they absorb water together with sodium chloride by a 19% approximate. Remember your ADH? What part of the brain, again, secretes your antidiuretic hormone? The posterior pituitary, together with the oxytocin. Just a quick endocrine review, no? So the ADH is a hormone which affects the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Again, what does ADH do? Antidiuretic, it prevents urine from being formed. And how does it do that? By restricting water into going into these tubes. So, mainly what it does is it, it amplifies the reabsorption. No? Tinotodo niya yung reabsorption so that no water will be wasted and only a few urine will be formed. On the other hand, we have the aldosterone. Oh, what produces the aldosterone? It is a mineralocorticoid. A mineralocorticoids, mineralocorticoids are produced by your zona glomerulosa. Diba? The zona glomerulosa. The outermost layer of the adrenal cortex. Kasi GFR, remember? Glomerulosa, fasciculata, 
reticularis. So, aldosterone and A, remember that it reabsorbs sodium naman in the distal convoluted tubule while allowing potassium and hydrogen to be secreted into the urine. So, kinukuha niya yung sodium, it gets the sodium, but it releases potassium and hydrogen in the urine or in the filtrate inside those tubules. Lastly, we have the collecting duct, which is just the final site for the concentration and dilution of urine. Okay? The last process is tubular secretion. In tubular secretion, the body will secrete substances inside those tubules, specifically substances that may be toxic in the body. And that includes your ammonia. As you can see in this image, you have your urea. Hydrogen, as mentioned, with potassium, specifically as an effect of your aldosterone. Creatinine, histamine, and some antibiotics. So, the body puts in those toxic materials inside the tubules so that they will be excreted into the urine. Lastly, we have the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So, you have to understand, guys, that the kidneys not only function for urine formation. The kidneys is also vital in the maintenance of blood pressure. Okay? So, we already talked about blood pressure previously in our cardiovascular system discussion. And it's not only the heart which is in charge of maintaining our blood pressure, but also the kidneys. So, any disease in the kidneys might affect blood pressure. So, you might have parents or relatives that does not necessarily have heart problems. They may just have a kidney problem, but their BP is shooting up or maybe plummeting down. That is because there is a hormone produced by the kidneys called renin. So, here is renin, renin, produced by the kidneys. So, it will produce renin. Renin will convert angiotensinogen which is produced naman by your liver. Okay? So, angiotensinogen is a precursor hormone produced by the liver. Once renin, which is produced by the kidney, acts on angiotensinogen, since this is a precursor hormone, it will be activated into angiotensin 1. Okay? Into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will then be converted by the angiotensin converting enzyme or simply your ACE, which is produced naman by the lungs, to be converted into your angiotensin 2. So, your angiotensin 1 will be acted upon by your ACE from the lungs to produce your angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is the one that uh, can affect your blood pressure. Why? Because it is a powerful vasoconstrictor. Vasoconstrictor meaning... It reduces the space of the blood vessels. It constricts the blood vessels. And when there is constriction of the blood vessels, blood pressure will increase. Remember when we were kids and we, we, we would play with the garden hose, no? We would open the faucet, hold the garden hose, and then try to press on one part of the garden hose, what will happen to the water? It will somehow go out with increased pressure, di ba? When you try to close the garden hose, that's what happens to the blood vessels. When you close the blood vessels, the blood flow will increase in pressure 
and will stimulate the release of your aldosterone. Aldosterone is something that is already familiar. It is produced by your adrenal cortex. And what will aldosterone do? It will cause the blood vessels to constrict and to further increase your blood pressure. Okay? So that's what aldosterone does. Inabsorb na yung sodium. And where sodium goes, water follows. So the dami yung water mo sa body. Water will increase in the body. Since water will increase, your blood volume will also increase. So blood pressure will really increase. More than that, aldosterone also has a vasoconstrictor ability. So it will further increase your blood pressure. So it is important for RAAS to be functioning properly. Or else, the patient will have hypertension even if they do not have a heart problem. So it is the excess release of this, and, um, of this group of hormones that leads to renal hypertension. Yeah. Again, if there's anything that is not clear, I suggest that you rewind it or watch other YouTube videos which can help you understand the RAAS system. Lastly, we have the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. So, the ureters are the muscular tube coming from the renal pelvis, remember? So, that renal pelvis, it will then go down to become the ureter, this muscular tube. And it will exit the kidney at the hilum and enter the urinary bladder at the inferior side. Okay? The urinary bladder is the collapsible muscular sac naman which acts as a temporary storage of urine. And since two ureters enter it, it will only have one exit and that is what we call the urethra. But before urine can go to the urethra, there is a gatekeeper again and that is what we call the urinary sphincter. That is the one that you open and close during urination. So this is actually a skeletal muscle. You're able to constrict that urinary sphincter on purpose. No, Especially when you're about to go na talaga to the um, comfort room when you really feel like you're about to pee, you purposely close your sphincters so that the uh, urine will not exit. And then lastly, we have the urethra, which is a muscular tube that extends from the anterior floor of the bladder to the outside of the body. Now, there's a statement at the end. Look, the urethra of males is longer than females because males have penis, right? So the tube that carries urine is longer for males because there is an extension of our male genitalia, and that is the penis. But for females, it is much shorter that is why urinary tract infection is also more common for females. Kasi once bacteria enters that short urethra of females, mabilis ma-access yung urinary bladder. No? And then that infection will go up and reach the kidneys. Lastly, here are just histologic slides showing you the renal cortex and the glomerulus. Here is the glomerulus, no? You have the Bowman's capsule lined by your podocytes. You also have the series of um, capillaries and the cortex, which you see surrounding the renal, uh, sorry, the glomerulus. So for the laboratory reports, please submit the following Sunday deadline, okay? 10 p.m. after your lab finals. Alright, I hope you learned something from me. Thank you guys and God bless.